Welcome to Skeletal Notes 1.4, where we'll be discussing bone development. Here are some of the terminology uh, that we will be using as we discuss how we get from a little baby up to your grown self. Before you have a fully developed skeletal system, you have primarily just this cartilage, which forms uh, more of a rough framework from which your body will eventually become a uh, skeletal, a bony skeletal system. You can see just from these two images, these two fetal images, beginning right around two months, we have the beginnings of a skeleton taking form. And then in this one, later on during fetal development, we have a bit more bone growth. There are two types of ossification. The first one is intramembraneous ossification, and this is going to give rise to all of our flat bones, such as the coxal bone, cranial bones, as well as our clavicle right in here. And then the second type of ossification is endochondral ossification, in which we develop the rest of the skeleton, such as our fingers, toes, arms, and ribs. A quick review of the structures involved in laying down our bony tissue. Osteoblasts are responsible for building all of our new bone, and the osteoclast will help with remodeling and shaping our bone. We'll begin with intramembranous ossification, in which we will be building our flat bones, such as those within the cranium. The first step here, as you can see, there's not much going on here, but you begin to see some um, beginnings of calcification, where it becomes a bit more dense. So these beginnings are known as a, an ossification center. So we'll begin with a cluster of osteoblasts, right, which will start in the center of where that new bone will take place. The next step, those osteoblasts are going to begin secreting bony matrix and will continue extending outward until it meets up with other bone. So they'll be laying down some of that bony material. Um, any cells that stay behind get trapped within, they will become our mature osteocytes. As it continues to grow outward from just cartilage to a bony plate here, the central parts of the bone will uh, begin to form this sort of uh, cavity, these little cavities to allow for blood vessels to penetrate and continue to provide nutrients. That is known as our spongy bone, in which later on will be filled with red marrow. The spongy bone or this, these holes within are due to the osteoclasts, which are constantly reshaping and remodeling the center here. So they will reabsorb some areas to allow for the passage of the blood vessels. This will continue outward until all of the bony plates are produced. So if you kind of watch my pen here, use red here. So we'll have this ossification center and it'll continue to grow outward until it completes its full plate. So this will happen over here. So forming our frontal bone, for instance, and we'll have another one over here. We'll, we'll have a, an ossification center and it will continue to grow outward until it meets up with the other bones. So it'll stop at that edge and that's where our sutures will begin and then eventually they will interlock. And you can see that located here. You can see how the growth continues onward until they meet up at neighboring bones and then the growth will stop at those locations. And that is our intramembranous growth. Now to look at endochondral ossification. So as the name implies here, we have endo, which means on the inside, okay, and then chondral refers to cartilage. So we're basically going to be taking the hyaline cartilage, which will make up all of the non-flat bone locations, 
and it will be converted into bone or ossification, right? So osseous tissue. Okay, the stages involved in endochondral ossification. First, at the center of that hyaline cartilage long bone, for instance, we'll have what's called a primary ossification sensor. So very similar to what we saw in the intramembranous ossification where you have this collection of the osteoblasts. These osteoblasts will begin to form outward, so not a whole lot of difference so far. And then our in the second stage here, we have the um, osteoclast will begin to sort of carve out to allow for the um, space for blood vessels to eventually penetrate. And then that'll, that's exactly what will happen here. We'll have from the periosteal bud or periosteal layer, which is the outer layer of cartilage, we'll have the blood will begin to penetrate within. And this space within is going to form that medullary cavity. So we'll have that space to allow all of those rich nutrients from the blood supply to penetrate and continue to provide nutrients for our growing bone. At the fourth stage, we'll have a secondary ossification center, which will begin to form the epiphysis at either ends of a long bone. And the same process, our osteoblasts will continue to lay down the groundwork or the bony matrix spreading outward, okay? Um, and we'll have the blood vessels penetrating inward to provide those rich nutrients. The osteoclast will continue to reabsorb and create those um, that spongy bone and just the bony sort of spindly shaped bony components known as trabeculae and filling out and then on the very very ends or exterior most component it will form that really fo tough tough or a fully dense compact bone all along the edges with the spongy bone comprising the middle. Now one unique feature of the endochondral ossification versus the intramembranous ossification is that we will maintain some of this hyaline cartilage um, separating the uh, epiphysis from the diaphysis. In addition, on the ends of the epiphysis, we'll maintain that hyaline cartilage um, and it will be known as articular cartilage on both ends. These sites are going to allow for continued growth throughout adulthood or into adulthood particularly with the epiphyseal plate, this will stay cartilage until you become an adult and then eventually it will simply ossify or become this bony dense tissue. However, the articular cartilage will remain as such um, throughout your adulthood. Growth of our long bone will occur after you are born, so this is all postnatal growth, up until you become your mature adult size. So for females, this will generally be at the average age of about 14, 15, and then for males, it'll be roughly around 18 years old. The process of long bone growth involves a combination of our osteoblasts as well as our osteoclasts. So they'll coordinate that growth. So the osteoblasts are going to be responsible for laying down the, uh, the bony matrix, so the calcium and other minerals and such. And then our osteoclasts are going to be involved in trimming and reshaping. We're going to be looking at what's called longitudinal growth in which we're going to extend the length of our bone. And then I'll also, in addition to that, show you what's called appositional growth in which we will grow a little bit thicker. The first stage of growth in the length is to add on new hyaline cartilage to these ends. We're going to add on some cartilage here. Okay, so beginning with the uh, articular cartilage. And then on top, so it's always going to be on top, on top of our epiphyseal plate, we'll then add on some new cartilage here. The next step 
that will occur is that the old cartilage will then begin to ossify. So our, our osteoblasts will begin replacing all of that old cartilage that was there and ossify it here. Okay, so now we have a little bit of um, extra growth here. So this is also going to occur within the width or the thickness of our bones as well. So we'll have some appositional growth. So the osteoblast that exists along the outside edges, just underneath the periosteum, they're also going to start to lay down some bone here. All right, so we won't have new cartilage, uh, new um, any new connective tissue, there's no cartilage, remember over here, it's all of that dense irregular tissue that forms our periosteum. So then we'll have some thickness here. All right, so once we've um, added some new bone, now that's gonna look kind of odd, we're gonna have to come in and do a little bit of shaping. From here, we just wanna kind of extend this area. So I don't know if you can see what I'm doing here. So I'm extending some of the um, trabeculae Okay, and um, going up into that. So that way I have that nice spongy bone continuing into the epiphysis, okay? And just a little bit on the outer edge. Now, I don't want a tremendously thick bone either because then that'll start to get really heavy. So I'll also trim along here and extend the width of my med med medullary cavity here. And we'll probably do a little bit of chiseling as well, so that way we have these nice refined edges and there'll be lots of remodeling and shaping to form that bone that we, we want. So if we want a humerus, we would shape the head of the bone to look like that um, hum um, humeral head or the femoral head and so on. <laughs> Another factor to consider in regards to bone growth and development is hormonal regulation. A hormonal regulation depends on the activity of our endocrine system. I've just highlighted a few of the glands involved. The first gland involved in growth, the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland's action involves the release of this hormone called growth hormone. And so just like it sounds, it's going to stimulate growth. Uh, in particular, it will stimulate collagen production as well as um, proteins and, and so on, anything involved in growth and development in general. So as we know, collagen is a major component found in a lot of the connective tissue. And so our epiphyseal plate um, depends on that collagen activity. So in order for elongation of bone, we need to add on to our epiphyseal plate as well as the articular cartilage. Fun fact, gro growth hormone is only released during times of sleep. So growth will happen only at night. So you can imagine how important sleep is for that simple fact. The next hormone that helps to regulate growth and development is known as the thyroid hormone, and that's produced by our thyroid gland. Uh, in terms of bone, it's going to help coordinate proportional um, component of elongation. So we want to make sure that as we add on new bone, we want to make sure that we also do the trimming so it doesn't look very odd and bulky shaped. So it's going to coordinate that activity of the osteoblast as well as osteoclasts. The next 
hormone that I'll be talking about here is our uh, sex hormones, particularly estrogen and testosterone. Initially, during um, our early stages of pubescence, when we see heightened activity or release of our estrogen and testosterone, that's going to stimulate all of those growth spurts that we tend to see uh, during early pubescence. So in females, that's usually uh, an average age of about 11. In males, it's an average age of about 14 years old in which we have a heightened release of those sex hormones. Now, both of these hormones will be found in male and female, just in different doses in each, um, respectively. So testosterone's role is going to be highly active in increasing the deposit of that calcium in bone. So with the increased amount of testosterone in males, we're going to have a tremendous uh, thicker or denser bone capacity here. So we'll see, as you can see in these images, all of this up on top, the male um, pelvic girdle and then the female pelvic girdle down here. And as you can see, even just from from this stage to this, there is considerable difference in the bone density, and you can see that right in this general area. Whereas females, there's not as much of um, an increase in that density comparatively, just because there's a lack of that estrogen, uh, excuse me, that testosterone in females. In addition, um, the estrogen and testosterone will also add to the characteristics. So with females, we'll tend to get the widening of that opening between the coxal bones, whereas in males, not quite so much. And if we compare from, so this would be considered like prepubescence, you're not seeing a whole lot of difference between the male and female pelvic girdles here you'll have um, the opening is relatively about the same and then once pubescence occurs it'll begin widening and even more so within the female toward the end of the growth stage or growth spurts of male and female there'll be an increase in estrogen production and that will basically end our growth, um, our longitudinal growth. So the estrogen increase will induce the epiphyseal plate closure. And as we know, females will end their growth quite sooner than males will, and that will coincide with the increased production in that female-specific hormone. In this image here, we can see changes in that epiphyseal plate here. So here we have the epiphyseal plate. This is from where our growth will occur. And then into an adulthood, we have that closure it becomes a lot more ossified. In fact, this will pretty much be, there'll be no more cartilage in that growth line or that epiphyseal line. Throughout our lifetime, well into our elderly age, our bone continues to differentiate and, and change and become remodeled. And this is going to be due to the amount of calcium levels within our blood. So whenever we have quite a bit of calcium, an excess amount of calcium, our thyroid gland will secrete another hormone called calcito calcitonin, and that will stimulate the activity of our osteoblast to deposit all of that calcium. Now, when our calcium levels in our blood reach a critically low level, our parathyroid gland, which is located just outside the thyroid gland, will secrete this hormone known as parathyroid hormone. Pretty easy to remember, right? Now, the parathyroid hormone's job will, to st will be to stimulate the osteoclast to resorb that bone and release that calcium back into the blood with the negative effect of having much thinner or more brittle bones. This can be become very dangerous if you do not have enough calcium in, in your body. Your bone will be one of the first places to give up its calcium, which will lead to some other major issues that we'll talk about in our next lesson. And that's it for our lesson on bone growth development and differentiation.